Hello there everyone, this is me Ethan here and welcome back to another video. It's been a while since I last did a video reviewing a film, but today I'm catching up and giving you all my thoughts on Black Panther Wakanda Forever and the Wednesday show on Netflix. So let's get started with Wakanda Forever since that released first. I would have released my review the weekend that Wakanda Forever released, but I was late on getting tickets and I ended up seeing it the weekend after its initial release. I then got sick only a couple days after, so this review is a bit overdue. First up, I thought they handled Chadwick Boseman's absence really well. The way that Ryan Coogler went about handling T'Challa's death felt natural and it made sense within the universe. All of the characters that mourn the loss of T'Challa are portrayed excellently by the cast which are also mourning the death of the actor behind the character. Because you know the actor behind the mask is gone, the performances feel real and even more emotional. Angela Bassett is easily the standout performance in this film and if she doesn't win some sort of award, the system is rigged. A lot of what Queen Ramonda says is really powerful and there's one scene in particular where everything is silent and it's super powerful and it's just her at her peak. Letitia Wright I thought handled her character really well. Her character arc slightly parallels T'Challa's in Captain America Civil War and I found that to be really cool. But going from the side character in the first movie to the main character in the next is not an easy task. Which brings me to one of my issues with the film, at some points it doesn't feel like there's a main character but I'll get to that later. Tene Cuerta as Namor was fantastic. His character can be both super fun and goofy to watch, and then threatening and intimidating in the next scene. He's got a similarity to Killmonger where his reasoning is understandable and you see where he's coming from. He's easily one of the best MCU villains, especially in Phase 4. Denai Guerrera and Lupita Nyong'o still feel cast to the side as Okoye and Nakia respectfully, but they're still both really good here and have some powerful scenes. Dominique Thorne as Riri Williams aka Ironheart was just alright. Her character was truly just a plot device for a good part of the film and then she's just absent for some parts of it where she isn't needed. She's easy set up for her TV show and I didn't hate her, she had some funny one liners but she just didn't do a whole lot to make me love her character. The only other two characters I have to mention are M'Baku and Everett Ross and I'm going to get straight to the point. M'Baku has some standout scenes, both emotionally and comedically, and Ross just feels completely unnecessary at times. Every time we jump back to him, I was kind of just annoyed because he didn't have a huge role overall in the film. What I appreciated most about the story here is that despite our main character being gone, it's still a direct continuation of the first. Certain plot points from the first you see here, and the fact that you can still continue your story without your main hero and make it feel cohesive, I respect. The main issue that I have is that this movie does feel like it's been reworked multiple times. It wants to be a movie about learning how to mourn loss and move on and not be vengeful, but at the same time it wants to have a slight message on imperialism and reliance on technology. There doesn't seem to be one singular focus, at least to me. And like I said before, it's hard to tell who the main character is throughout every act of this movie. For multiple scenes, Queen Ramonda is at the forefront, for others it's Shuri, and others it's even Namor. Whenever we focus on one character, it feels like they are the main character, which helps the characterization and performances, but at the same time it's strange because it doesn't feel like there's one character that we follow throughout. The soundtrack and the score, just like the first, are once again amazing. Ludwig Göransson is still a fantastic composer and I love how he reuses old themes while also creating new ones. I wish more sequels did that and it makes this movie feel even more connected to the original. The cinematography here is also infinitely better than the first, and I loved how much color there was. Talacon alone blew me away. All in all, I give Black Panther Wakanda Forever an 8 out of 10. It somehow managed to continue the story of the first film despite being dealt a terrible hand and having your lead actor die. This and Spider-Man No Way Home are the only projects in all of Phase 4 that had the most emotion and feel the most like Phase 3. Moving on to Wednesday, I'll start out by saying that this show took me by complete surprise. It was not on my radar at all. I had seen the trailer and it was recommended to me on Netflix around Thanksgiving, but I made nothing of it. I've never seen anything Adams Family related either. I know the character names and the general concept, all because the Adams Family are iconic Halloween characters, but I had never seen any Adams Family content. All of a sudden, after it released though, it blew up all over social media. It currently has the most viewing time within a single week for a Netflix show and it's at the number 3 spot in Netflix's all-time English language TV show ranking. 
and it's inching towards 1 billion views and taking the number 2 spot. Because it blew up and I hadn't watched a whole lot of movies or TV lately, I gave it a shot since I was bored and I ended up pretty happy with it. This show stars Jenna Ortega as a teen Wednesday Addams and she is the shining star of this show. Without her, it would not be as good nor as popular as it is right now. And in this show, she gets sent to Nevermore Academy after being expelled, and Nevermore is a school full of outcasts. There are students who are werewolves, vampires, shapeshifters, and much more. The fun of sending Wednesday to a school full of crazy outcasts is that she is still a crazy outcast. I'm pretty sure the idea of the Adams Family is for them to be kooky fish out of water characters in the real world. So to place one of the family members in a school full of fish out of water characters is a fun and unique idea to shake things up a bit. Though, after seeing Ortega as Wednesday and the rest of the cast as the characters, I would love to see an Adams Family film starring this new cast. With the school, it does feel very similar to Hogwarts from Harry Potter. It's a large castle-like building with multiple different groups of students, some are bully characters, and some are not. But I will say, the world building is pretty well done and it all has that Tim Burton-y gothic style. I just wish we saw more of these different cliques of students. With that being said though, the show is part teen drama, part mystery. The teen drama stuff isn't all that great. The bullying towards Wednesday gets old because we've seen it all before. Thankfully, after 3 or 4 episodes though, the cheesy bully stuff does die down. But there's also a love triangle conflict throughout the entire show which I just didn't get. Neither of the two guys into Wednesday are very interesting except for Tyler who has a mystery going on with his dad, the town sheriff, but even then he's not that interesting. It just doesn't make any sense either why these two guys would like Wednesday at all. She's very selfish and very antisocial. More power to you guys for having a type, but she pushes anybody and everybody away from her unless she needs them. The relationship with her roommate Enid is decent as well. She's playing the polar opposite of Wednesday and it makes a somewhat fun dynamic. This is one of the best parts of Wednesday's character, her relationships that she does not want. She does not want friends and she doesn't think friends are important. Yet so many people at this school are desperate to be social with her and she keeps pushing back. Even her relationship with the principal of the school is very fun and their arguments are written in such a fun way. Having a main character fall into a basic story and constantly reject it is really funny to me and Janet Ortega's one-liner delivery is excellent throughout. The more interesting part of the story is with the mystery, or rather mysteries. There's a main mystery with a monster killing students at the school, and that's what kept me intrigued throughout all the teen drama stuff that I didn't care for. There are constantly different pieces to the puzzle unraveled, and there are many twists and turns. This show 100% works better as a Wednesday detective show than a teen drama, however. Wednesday is also having hallucinations that look into the past and the future that somehow connect to the murder mystery. I wasn't a big fan of her essentially having superpowers, but at least it advanced the story. There's even an episode dedicated to Wednesday figuring out whether or not her father, played to perfection by Luis Guzman, killed a student while he was at Nevermore. And this leads me to a big issue with the show. There is too much of it. There are so many different plot points and things going on that at some point some of them can feel like filler. And worst of all, some storylines just are never finished. The bully character Bianca is in conflict with her mother in the middle of the show, and by the end of it, nothing. There's never any resolution with her character subplot. I did like that this show was half directed by Tim Burton, the first four episodes, but it didn't feel like classic Tim Burton because it is a show set in the 2020s. The references to TikTok and Instagram I wasn't a big fan of. I really wish that Tim Burton could have directed the final half of the show though because there's so much more interesting and exciting things unfolding with the mystery. The ending is also very Marvel to me where there's a big bad that shows up in the end and it just didn't work for me. After saying all this, my biggest complaint is that there are too many ideas and things happening at once where it feels really overstuffed. And like I said before, some subplots aren't even finished. It cuts back and forth and there's just so much going on. The pacing isn't that bad, but whenever Wednesday is not at the forefront, it feels like it slows down quite a bit. The tone I thought was pretty fun. It's got a teen angst to it and of course the darkness is there with Tim Burton. What I really loved is that it's a darker coming of age story. It's a type of story that you've seen before but with a tone you've never seen with it. The visuals are fun and during some set pieces you know it is Tim Burton at play. 
Some of the CGI was iffy at times, and it does remind you that this is a Netflix show after all. Overall, I give Wednesday on Netflix a 7 out of 10. It is a far from perfect TV show. It feels overstuffed at times, and not everything feels complete. But it is a show that gets you easily hooked with intrigue and a fantastic lead performance. It is a perfectly fine and fun show coming from a streaming service. So there are my thoughts on Black Panther Wakanda Forever and Wednesday on Netflix. Have you seen either of these projects? If so, what are your thoughts? I'd love to hear any and all opinions in the comment section below. So if you all enjoyed these reviews, and if you all enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and as always, I'll see you all in the next one. Bye and have a great day.